it took it took three visits from us to actually grasp that garden, I think. Now, the, the reason I think is because it was so cleverly planted. Rebecca subtomentosa Henry Eilers, which I think you already oh, have. That is, that's got those lovely thin petals. It demands attention. You have to look at it. People that don't know begonias terribly well, there's an enormous variety. Just look at that leaf. A great curly leaf, almost like a snail shell. That's going to make a whopping great cushion of a plant. And that one is called Curly Fire Flush. <laughs> Hello and welcome to a special Chelsea Flower Show edition of Talking Dirty. Back home over at East Ruston Old Vicarage in lovely pastel hues, we have Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. Well, over in Cambridgeshire this morning, in the floral fantasia, we have Thordis Maria Sophia Fredriksen. And after our day out together and long train journeys yesterday, we're fresh as daisies. Oh, so <laughs> fresh. I don't feel remotely tired. I do feel a bit giddy getting to spend the whole day hobnobbing with Alan and looking at all the flowers. Ironically, I am actually better dressed today for this podcast, really. Uh, I, I, I decided to be comfortable and colourful at Chelsea. So it was dungarees and sparkles and all of that. But I've gone a bit more refined to talk well, about very ladylike. <laughs> very yeah, ladylike. Well, it wasn't yesterday, it was trainers and dungarees yesterday, but I was happy. And it really was an extraordinary day. We were very lucky to get to go to what might be the only ever September Chelsea Flower Show, the greatest flower show on earth, uh, resplendent with seasonal treats and treasures. And it wasn't the only unusual thing about the flower show, because I think, and I might be wrong about this, so correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, but I think it was the first show where you could buy plants from stands in the, the Great Floral Pavilion. I've never seen that before. No, I haven't either. I mean, I, they, uh, we know that on the last day of the show, you can, you can buy things and you see people trudging out crowds of them with delphinium six foot tall. And you think that you'll never get that home without damaging it or breaking it or something else. Um, no. And the strange thing was that we had these lovely stands. I mean, the one thing that I remember distinctly is looking at a stand of cacti with you. And you said, gosh, look at that one, it's 30 years old. And then I said, but that one's 60 years old. Yes. <laughs> it's amazing. Huge, huge, venerable, um, fat, barrel-shaped cacti um, sitting there. It's very strange. One thing was strange, though. When I got to my train at Liverpool Street Station, I got on the train, and I was sitting there waiting for it to take off or go, you know. And along came this woman carrying this standard fuchsia in full <laughs> flower. And I thought, they haven't sold anything at Chelsea yet like that. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know where she got that from, but she went all the way to Norwich with it. And it, I must say, it left the station at Norwich in very good condition. Cossetting <laughs> it. It's probably there on the seat next to her. It's little, yeah, little bells dingling yeah. and dangling. Uh, you obviously went to the train with several plants. I think the first one that really got you, that wooed you, was, well, actually a couple of begonias. Yeah, begonias. Um, I'm a great fan of begonias and um, Dibley's. Um, of Wales, where they're somewhere in Wales, I think they are. Um, they they specialise in streptocarpus. They had a most wonderful array of streptocarpus, um, all looking perfect, of course, because that's what Chelsea is all about. But they also accompanied it with begonias. And I've got some that I bought here, um, and this is one that I've wanted for a long time. This oh. is um, Little Brother Montgomery. Oh, and it has it has lovely pink flowers as well as these beautiful marked leaves. And this one grows about sixty centimetres tall, I suppose. And I have this earmark for using in tropical looking garden schemes in semi shade when I get enough plants from this one, because I'm going to chop this one up and take some cuttings. But I'm now thinking about whether I should do it now or whether I should do it, wait until spring to do it. It's probably safer to wait until spring. If you take cuttings too early, you've then got to overwinter them. And, you know, if you get a small cutting, sometimes they can be difficult to overwinter. Um, another one that I bought was this one, which I didn't intend to buy at all, but I saw this on the stand as well. It's called Joyful Blaze. And the reason it's called Joyful Blaze is the, is the foliage. If you look at the foliage of that, you can see that it does really look almost like flames. But that again has um, pink flowers, which I thought was rather a, a good thing. Um, and I think that, you know, for people that don't know begonias terribly well, there's an enormous variety. 
um, as is shown by this leaf here. Now, whether this one flowers or not, I don't know, but just look at that leaf, that great curly leaf, almost like a snail shell, but not quite. Lovely hairy red stems for the leaves. And that's gonna make a whopping great cushion of a plant. And that one is called Curly Fire Flush. <laughs> Oh, I don't know who thinks it's amazing, but just look at the wonderful, hairy, fluffy oh. stems here um, on the leaf, that, that pattern, and the way that it curls around like that is absolutely fantastic. You know, sometimes I really wish I was less restrained. Not often, because obviously restraint and, and I are not very well acquainted. But at, <laughs> at knowing that I had quite a lot of stuff to carry, I was kind of carrying radio equipment and things, and I had a long train journey back, and I didn't think it was sensible to be carrying plants around all day. And I really wish I'd bought at least one begonia, because little <laughs> little brother Montgomery, uh, he's he's a rather a looker. He is a looker, but there were so many, weren't there? I mean, I could have bought, I could have bought half a dozen at least, but I couldn't carry them all. And the one thing I wanted to to get really from them was a decent sized plant. And you know, normally if you buy from Dibley's, that they send tiny little plug plants out. I'm going to actually ask them if they send um, slightly bigger plants. Uh, I think they do, but there will be a cost attached to that, of course. Because. The there was one you wanted that they didn't have for sale at the show, and I don't think I kept a note of its name, but there was a rather jazzy brand new one that they uh, that you're going to probably be hunting on their website for. Yes, there is, and I don't know whether I've got the, the, name, the name of it either. Um, but I might have, you never know. It could be <laughs> lurking amongst the many pictures on my phone. because I We have like you. so many notes. <laughs> I have got it. It's called Begonia Rochhart, R-O-C-H-E-A-R-T. So that's another one that I'm going to look out for. But you found yourself. I mean, I, I turned around and I said, Thordis, where's Thordis gone? <laughs> well, and, and it wasn't crowded, but you were in a, you, well, you were behind a huge mound of the most beguiling flowers. Well, it was a coping mechanism as much as anything. I knew that if I stood next to you much longer, I was going to buy a begonia that I didn't really have the room to carry all day. So I turned around to distract myself and it was it couldn't have been easier to distract myself because there was this fantastic towering stand next to the the Dibley stand in the great floral pavilion at the Chelsea Flower Show. And it was Daisy Roots. Now, if you watched the Chelsea coverage at the end of Press Day on the Monday, um, where they had the odd celebrity, but they did kind of take you around and show you some of the show gardens. And because the Daisy Root stand was just full of fabulous prairie planting that they wanted to sort of be able to quickly show in one spot, they went round the stand showing all the rudbeckias and grasses that had been used. And um, if you're an Instagram person, Daisy Roots, their Instagram is perennial potty. So follow those. It's a, a Hertfordshire based nursery run by Anne Godfrey. And um, boy, oh boy, can Anne pick her plants. Now I've written down a list of the things from this one stand that I, uh, I was coveting. Just Rudd Becky is to die for. And I think I'm about to start quite a long love affair with Rudbeckia triloba because they're so beautiful. Prairie Glow was on the stand. Yeah. I fortunately bought Prairie Glow from Monk Silver Nursery at your plant fair, Alan. So I didn't need to flow mo over that. I've, uh, I've got that one. But Rudbeckia triloba blackjack, that was a dainty, fabulous little thing. Um, obviously, you know, with the kind of Rudbeckia jazzy colours going on. Um, also, Rudbeckia subtomentosa Henry Eilers, which I think you already oh, have. That is, that's got those lovely thin petals. Yeah. It's the way the flower presents itself, isn't it? It's not a big flower, but it's just the, it demands that it demands attention. You have to look at it. Uh, so much. I mean, that that's shot right up there to the top of the Flomo list. If incidentally you've never listened to one of our Talking Dirty podcasts before, if you've just found us because of Chelsea, Flomo is a floral or plant based FOMO. So the plant that's given you a fear of missing out and you desperately want to grow it. So I think Henry Eilers, that uh, Rabecchia subtomentosa, certainly a lot of Flomo with that. But I think the clever thing that had happened on this stand was how um, and had, had intermingled plants. That wonderful combination of Hesperantha cochinea with steeper Ornicella tenuissima. So you've got the lovely sandy shades yeah. of the grass with the bright, fabulous, zingy red of the Hesperantha. There's one thing I would say about that. <laughs> this is, um, <laughs> well, you know, this is, um, it's a bit like flower arranging with plants in pots, isn't it? 
<laughs> because you can put two plants together that wouldn't necessarily love exactly the same conditions. And I don't think that the grass would like the same conditions that the Hesperantha, which used to be called Shizostelis, um, it, it, it have, have, that likes moist soil. Uh, you can even grow it underwater in shallow water. So if you've got a small wow. pond, that's worth a consideration because um, Shizostelis or Hesperantha as it now is, um, the Cassinia major is the one to go for because Cassinia major has slightly larger and slightly more prolific flower flowers than the, just the straight Cassinia. Um, I've always thought of them as being end of year plants because they start flowering in about, at about now really. And one of the things that we used to do is we used to grow them in pots in the greenhouse, just cold glass. And you have, if you do that, you can have red flowers for picking at Christmas. Or you can bring the whole pot into the house if you want to. But it's just something, I mean, don't leave it in the house too long because the, the heat will sort of upset its equilibrium, you know. Um, but it's a lovely thing to have. But, you know, the, the grass, I think, prefers slightly drier conditions. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, um, I'm not going to say it's naughty, but it's... Uh, <laughs> Well, you know, that's that's kind of what the floral pavilion is. I mean, if you consider that meanwhile over the way you had loads of alliums, I mean, the, yeah. the fact that they've managed to get a ton of alliums in flower in you know mid-September, I suppose there is the kind of artifice and the performance aspect of Chelsea. But it was a phenomenal eye catching combo. Oh, yes, absolutely. But I mean, uh, I, and I think um, that you do get the slight feeling that I don't want to look at alliums now because it's October well, because yeah. they're just, they are. I mean, they are the the. One of the plants that you see in all the Chelsea gardens because it's the right time of year for them, probably. Um, you know, so things, some things are slightly forced and all that. But I don't know how the heck they managed to hold them back like that. I mean, no. that that was a, I mean, it must be down to uh, the control of heat, the control of light. Um, and they they looked quite real. I mean, they didn't look no. forced. They weren't etiolated or, you know, drawn up in any way. They They were just normal alliums. But yeah. I did get the slight feeling, I don't know whether I want to see you this time of the year. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the point which I turned back to the combinations on the, the, the beautiful Daisy Root stand. Um, Penicetum, uh, I can struggle with this, Allopecuroides redhead, that was combined with Sangrasorba blackthorn, which was a phenomenal combo of those lovely sort of autumnal shades. Um, you were tokened by the Venonia Arkansana mammoth, mammoth um which was basically yeah. a big tall venonia yeah i was because suddenly the, the, the flowers are quite flat it's such a rich papal purple that's what i loved about it and if you pull them apart individually the flowers all look like little shaving brushes <laughs> and i just thought that was such a a, a, a zing it, it it shouted out to me look at me look at me i'm you know i'm here i'm purple it's up to it's september and i'm flowering it's lovely <laughs> And it was sort of intermingling with Verbena and Bidens and all these sort of seasonal yeah. loveliness. I yeah. have got one or two Venonias, and I think I have in one of my, you know, journals, I've written a, a list, get more Venonias, because they are late summer gems. Um, and they come along, you know, thing is, I don't think they bulk up terribly quickly. No. So you have to wait. Yeah, Maybe. well, I mean, you could, I think you've got to be dogged about it. If you get a plant and you want to increase it, and we'll go into some of this uh, a little bit later on in this broadcast, but if you want to buy one and force yourself to pull it to bits in the spring, pull it to pieces, each bit has got a root, make sure that you then put them in a row in the garden or put them in a in, in pots, keep them safe. And if you do it again the following year, you you know, that's the way to do it. Build yeah. up your stock. Yeah. Um, just before we leave Daisy Roots, um, there was a crocosmical Babylon that you were very taken with. Yes, I was a little, small flowered one, but the most brilliant, brilliant red, which I thought was lovely. Yeah. And you saw one there too, I think. Well, I mean, there were quite there were a few crocosmias going on. There was one called Ember Glow on a different stand that I thought was lovely. That was quite near a butyl on orange glow. That was a real glowing stand. It was a glowing. <laughs> yeah, that was a. I mean, that was a. That was a shouty plant, I think. <laughs> yeah, it was very shouty. I think that might have been on the in bloom stand. Um, but anyway, also the the daisy root stand, they had the very top. So we sort of described it as a mountain of plants. And at the top was a um, helianthus, I think, orgialis, um, looking at its label. And it sort of erupted from the top of them with it this did, yeah. huge it sort of helianthus. Like a, 
yeah. well, volcanoes are in the news, and that was what it was a bit like, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. I mean, it was like very much like an explosive volcano, and there was the lava shooting out the top. <laughs> and uh, and also talking of fieriness, final plant from Daisy Roots before we move on to anything else, Heliopsis Helianthordes fire twister, which. Yes stopped you in your tracks it did it did i just thought it was the most wonderful zingy colors i mean and just uh, well I, I i said to you earlier on this morning when we were having a little chat you know the going to chelsea at this time of the year has made me want to produce um an autumn border but it's difficult isn't it because you know if you want you say this is the autumn border tell that to somebody in may and they're going to look the, the other way or go somewhere else or something <laughs> because they're not going to be interested in it and for people that have a small garden and, and they, they can't have a designated border for a particular time of year, I think what you've got to work towards is you've got to work towards um, a little bit of artifice in, in your own life, in a way, uh, in that you have perhaps a standing ground. Um, if, you've got a pop, if you've got a little veg plot and you can give half of that to a standing ground for later flowering plants, this is what you do. You actually have plants in your border that you can move. So if you've got if you've grown lupins, for instance, lots of people treat lupins as as bedding plants today because they're so easy to grow from seed or cuttings and they dig them up and throw them away when they're finished flowering. Um, or you can take them and line them out in another another plot. Um, and when you get to the autumn and you you get your, shall we say, any form of Michaelmas daisy, you can do this with garden outside flowering chrysanthemums. You can do this with what you do is you water them the day before in your in your growing patch give them a jolly good watering, then hopefully this coincides with a bit of dull weather because th that helps, you know, you don't do it in, in bright sunshine. Then you dig your plant up and you put it into, it into your border. But when you put the soil back around the roots of the plant, don't put your hands or your feet around it to jam it in. What you do is you puddle it in. So you take a two gallon watering can and you put that all the way around. And if you do that and you keep them watered for five, four, five, six, ten days afterwards, that plant will flower for you as if it's been there the whole summer. It, will, it won't notice the move, but that's your little bit of uh, dodging around in the garden. So, you know, by doing it this way, you haven't got a plant that's a passenger for eight, nine months of the year before it flowers. Yeah. That's that's just a, a little way of doing it. And I think the other thing is that people can do is if you have plants growing in pots, like we often do this with with lilies. Um, if we've got a pot full of lilies and we've got a bare pot, bare place in the border, I make a shallow scoop so I can bury half the pot of lilies, leave them in the pot, but just put that in the border. You, you won't notice the pot because it's covered with all um, disguised by all the surrounding foliage. But do do not forget to water it, though, no. because. You know, that's the one thing you've got to do. And there you can have a wonderful stand of lilies. And, you know, let's face it, when lilies go over, they're not the prettiest looking plants, especially if they get predated upon by the lily beetle. And I think that's very difficult to grow lilies without that happening. Um, then you can whip the pot out and put it in uh, your standing area or somewhere, yeah. you know, where you don't have to look at it. My only unfortunate thing is my standing area is almost always the patio outside the back window, which isn't ideal. But small gardens no, this are is, what small gardens a, are. Yeah, this is a problem for people with small gardens, I admit. Um, and, you know, I think the best thing you can do is make friends with a neighbour with a big piece of garden it doesn't use. <laughs> You're giving me ideas, Alan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, anyway, I think you can tell I love the Daisy Root stand. I wrote down so much from there. But the, the floral pavilion, I mean, is always just, you know, as Alan said, with the 60 year old, big, fat, revered uh, succulents earlier, there's perfection, there's precision, there's just plants at the absolute top of their game in the, the pavilion. It's, it's wonderful to see and get inspiration. Um, we, we saw the stand from Darcy and Everest who came on this podcast and did their Alpine special months ago um, with their sort of broken plant pots on the side within other containers yeah. and the, the succulents sort of spilling out. And you think I could go home and do that with my Sempervivans. Yeah, you could. I mean, there was so much inspiration on that stand. Um, I want to, I grow, um, I've got, I think, eight, 10, 12, 12 alpine troughs in the garden filled with alpines, many of them from Darcy and Everest, I have to say. Spring and early summer, no problem at all, but you get to the high summer and then into the autumn. Quite often there's a dearth of, of flowers that are actually blooming at this time. And um, I was interested to see Darcy and Everest because 
Um, there was the, some lovely, lovely plants. I'm going to leave the little blue one to you because I think you spotted that first. <laughs> I didn't, but I was looking at the diaskias and I thought there was two diaskias. Lilac bell was one and then there was a pink one. Um, no, lilac bell was the pinky one. There was a, a much darker, thundery looking one, yeah. um, which is almost sort of purple and gray. It's a strange shade, but so fascinating. There's a beautiful, beautiful blue gentian, um, which is one that I must get um, flowering now, and a lovely little sedum uh, as well. I can't remember all the names of them, but I mean, they were absolutely stunning. But it gives you a look into what you can do at this time of the year. Before we leave, or before I leave um, Darcy and Everest, I saw a wonderful Sempervivum called Mulberry Wine. And Mulberry Wine had the, the leaves coming out like the rosette were green, but deep in the heart was this really dark wine red colour. It was fascinating. Um, and, you know, they have a mass of Sempervivums there. And this one stood out from the rest. I mean, it just shone like a beacon. So that's on my wish list as well. They've been quite clever. I mean, going back to the artifice of Chelsea, they've yeah. done a thing which you wouldn't do in your own, unless you wanted an immediate showpiece, like in the centre of a table or something. But um, they had taken loads of different little bits of Sempervivum and they'd crammed them into colanders, of all things. Yeah. Uh, these, these new sort of zingy colanders and they were dotted around a stand. And for a Chelsea showstopper, I mean, they were too close together for actual planting. But... For that moment, for that week, they they really made you just want to photograph them and stare into them. They were kind of mesmerising. I, you know, what I thought. I thought for anybody that likes sempervivums, buy one of those colanders, and that's a colander for draining vegetables. We're yeah. talking about a colander jam full of those scents, and you've got I don't know 10, 12 different varieties in there. Um, all you've got to do is let them have that, give it give it to them as a gift, and they can then split them up, and they've got masses and masses of scents really. Wonderful, wonderful thing it looked great and you said that there was a plant which really caught my eye it was one that was for sale again why didn't I buy it um but it was a lovely little comelina now I don't I know that there are various different comelinas sadly I don't grow any at the minute but this I haven't seen before comelina dianthifolia and it was a dear little thing I think you'd call it a diminutive little darling Alan I would <laughs> Which is exactly what it was, because it had those piercing blue flowers. And there's something about the blue flowers of a comelina. I mean, I grow comelina tuberosa and comelina robusta. Uh, robusta is a big plant. I mean, it, it can grow a metre tall and it weaves it. Uh, I grow it pl primarily planted through shrubs. And then people see it, the flowers, these lovely three petaled, brilliant piercing blue flowers. And they wonder what the devil it is, um, because you can't see much of the plant. Um, it's a floppy thing, but that's the way to grow it. If you if you grow it through a shrub, it gives it support. But this little one called Dianthifo Dian Dianthifolia, that grows to about, I suppose, no more than about three and a half, four inches tall. Yeah. Dinky. Dinky. Very dinky and very darling. Oh, there was also a jaw-droppingly bright Lychnis, um, Lychnis wilfordii carafoto, which you almost need the sunglasses on. <laughs> <laughs> it was piercing. Yeah. Oh, fabulous stuff. But before, um, before we leave leave that stand as well, do we, we ought to just mention the, the Roscoeas that they had. Oh, because yes. they, they, it was a, they have been growing Roscoeas at Darcy and Everest from seed. And I know that um, people around us have been growing them from seed as well. Richard Clark, who has the National Collection of um, Eucomis in uh, Norfolk here, um, he came to the plant there and he'd been growing... Um, these plants from seed roscoeas and had many plants um and he went to a plant fair two days before our plant fair and i just sent the, him and emma an email saying please can you bring me some and they said no we've sold them all and they would literally had sold out um but darcy and everest if you want to have a look at theirs they've been growing some of these seed strains roscoeas crossed and what is a roscoe it's something it's it's akin to something a bit like a ginger plant yeah. really but it's they're much less tall. Gingers or court layers, they look a little bit like that, but they've got this lovely sort of tongued flower. Um, they grow a huge selection on the rock garden at Wisley, actually. If you want, if you do, if you go to Wisley, do have a look at them at this time of the year because they're fascinating. Yeah, marvellous plants. I don't grow any of those either. And they're, they're on the wish list. Um, talking of wish lists, I think there was one stand in the pavilion more than any other that probably left Alan with a long wish list. Some of the plants not even available yet. We spent quite a long time poring over 
the stand and talking to the lovely, very clever people at Surreal Succulents. Yeah, they and, were good. They were nice guys, actually, oh, weren't they? Great guys. And they have been doing brilliant work. If you've been following the Chelsea Flower Show, you may already know about their exciting creation where they've basically crossed Sempervivums and Aeoniums to create a Semponium, which brings together, I suppose, really, Alan, the best qualities of both. Well, yes, you've got the colour. I mean, the, 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 the thing about you, you mentioned some of them are not released yet. The Rele release date is next year. And we were looking at these fantastic black aeonium type looking plants, but that were, the, that were actually semponiums and they were huge, shiny black rosettes, you know, that big. Um, of course, when we buy the plants, they'll probably be only that big because they're, they're babies. And I've got a baby one here, which I bought. Um, yesterday and I mean it is it, it's, it's a little bit extravagant I have to say because that this little chap here is a, is a symponium and it's called sienna um, and but you can see the lovely markings there the red outer leaves and the bright green heart there and I did actually quite well because I asked the fellas if they could look for one that's got babies on it already so you can just see there there's a couple of little rosettes coming already now that's me being a bit greedy I suppose really um but I mean I was talking I was tempted to buy this anyway but my fate was sealed when they gave me an Aeonium they said oh you better have one of these because you you're so nice and you've been talking to us and I said well as you've given me one I'll buy this one and it cost me 35 pounds it's quite a lot of money and I think you know, you can buy these between 35, I got the cheapest one, or you can spend up to 50 pounds on a, on a larger one. And that's what I was traveling. I thought, well, I've got to have a smaller one. <laughs> but it will be interesting. I think it'd be very interesting to see. Um, all right, so you've got to make the investment and you're probably going to be spending 35, 40 pounds on each of these. A friend of mine I went to see the other day in, in Suffolk, um, he said to, he's a grower and he bought some, I don't know where he got them from, he bought some aeoniums and there, I think there were probably either 12 or 15. I can't remember. He said, how much do you think that little lot cost me? Oh, I said 150 pounds. He said 350 pounds. So that's the cost of unusual succulents. Um, but they won't stay that sort of money for very long. You know, give it five years and they'll, they'll all come down in price because everybody would be pulling all the little bits off and propagating like mad. And we can all have them at a relatively reasonable cost. But certainly uh, very exciting to go to the flower show and see essentially a new plant, also a plant that screams East Ruston Old Vicarage. It's... And, and, and yes, and, and also, you know, those two young chaps on that, on that stand, I mean, they are, they're breeding with a young gardener's head, if you see what I mean, not an old one like me. I mean, you know, <laughs> that, that, you know the younger people love succulents. They love those shapes. They, they like big leaves. They like big, you know, Chunky plants, I think you can you can I see when I uh, people come around the garden, young families, I'm talking about, you know, somewhere between the ages of 25 to 40, um, the younger generation, they're buying decidedly different plants to the plants that their their parents would have bought. Yeah. Well, people do get uh, associations as a little bit of an aside. I've got friends who get into gardening and they say, oh, what plant would you recommend I grow here? And I say, well, may maybe an aces. Oh, I don't like aces. They were in my grandmother's garden or a fuchsia. Yeah. Or I don't like fuchsias. And it's, it's, I don't know whether I don't have those associations because so many of my plants, well, also I, I quite like the plants my mother and grandmother grew, but uh, a lot of my plants I associate with how you've grown them. So I don't necessarily get quite the same hang-ups maybe municipal plants a bit different but you're right lots of people they just immediately discount an entire family based on maybe one plant that they just didn't really like in a family garden i'll see if i can find you a little bit of a fuchsia in a minute <laughs> because it's growing it's growing it's, it's called silver something or other it's growing around my front door and my back door and i left it there over the winter not expecting it to to survive and it has some of it died, the bits that grew further out from the wall died, but that the piece close to the wall um, is growing uh, in, in with a jasmine polyanthemum again, which is a tender plant. Um, but that flower, the jasmine flowers outside for me in June, July, not in the winter as we normally buy as a pot plant. Um, but the fuchsia, I think I ought to show you. Have you got, could you just hold it for two minutes while I get a little spring? Because I think yes. it's something worth looking at. <laughs> I feel as if I've been in the jungle looking at. Um, Looking oh, at plants. Now, can you see that? Look, see, people normally think fuchsias are the big, blousy, really quite horrid things. And if I hold that up to the camera there, 
you can actually see they're tiny little sparkly flowers, brilliant cerise red with a paler middle to it. If I just turn that slightly, you can see into the flower and it's quite pale in the middle. And that add that to the fact that the foliage is quite silver and it's got quite red stems too. And you've got yeah. a delightful plant, I think. And this has gone, <clears throat> it's about eight to nine feet tall on the wall of my, on the east facing wall of my back door. To, to return to surreal succulents, in case the sort of coverage online does or coverage on television doesn't doesn't kind of show you the ones that are going to be launched next year I did take some photos that we can pop into this podcast next year they've got Semponium Diamond coming also uh, Semponium Halo and I think Alan mentioned one with some extremely glossy dark foliage which I believe was called Vortex it so was. these are all heading our way in 2022 and they were all very exciting looking. Also, those Semponiums aside, there was an Echeveria called Moon Shadow that I think oh, you, yes. uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you liked the look of that one. Yes, I did. I mean, I really did. I mean, one of the ways you can actually increase your stocks of, of Echeverias and quite a few other succulents, if you pull the leaves off, um, and gently and then leave them for two or three days to just dry out so that the cuts or the, or the rend where you've rent it away from the parent plant so that, that dries out and then just put them in a very gravelly mix and they will make small plantlets around the base of that leaf so that's a good way of propagating them as well and that's a good way of getting children into gardening I think as well is to show them how, 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 to, how to do that. And of course I mean if bits break off they also generally root you yeah, know, if, you, if it gets tall or whatever and a bit of that, I had a houseplant at Javeria and um, I think something happened to it. No, whoever did it shall remain nameless, but I think it was not knocked <laughs> I off. I wonder who that was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it rooted, you know, happily, merrily. It was beheaded, but it came back to life. Um, also, at Javeria, Ranoni variegata Akehosi, that was lovely. There was an Echeveria called Rainbow. Oh, they had a fabulous flowering Aeonium nobile. Um, big old plume of flower on that you know the problem with that one though don't you <laughs> yeah I've had it and because it's monocarpic it's monocarpic so it does that wonderful plume of brilliant red flowers and I mean it's a big head it's about as big as a football almost and um you know lovely red flowers it makes lots of seed and then it dies so you've got to remember to have some seed handy so that you can get the next generation going um, and we are trying to do that at the moment with that particular, I think, it, I think. Well, how do you say it, Nobile? Nobile, Aerium Nobile, I, I think, who knows. Um, the other great thing they'd done was with their Aeonium tabuliform. Yes. Tabuliform, however you want to say that, they presented them on the sort of on the vertical so that that wonderful flat Aeonium was against the stand facing you and um, which when we talked to them about it was actually inspired by their natural growing site. Yes they grow in the crevices between rocks and they normally grow um, so they're it's actually so that any rain doesn't sit in the middle of the, of the rosette it drains away sharply and naturally and that's the way it likes to grow and I think if you actually see them growing in the wild which I haven't done I have to say um, and it probably comes from somewhere like the Canary Islands, and we won't be going there at the moment because we mentioned the volcano earlier, and we know all about that. Um, but yes, it's um, it's quite fascinating to see the way that plants adapt to living in the environment in which they find themselves, and that has adapted to growing in the crevices of rocks, and it grows um, on the vertical, as it were. Yeah, so clever to see it like that, and um, and then. We've done Echeveris, we've done Aeoniums before we leave Surreal Succulents. Their Agave Potatorum Kishokan, um, I thought was rather fantastic as well. Uh, that was fabulous. Alas, not hardy, but, you know, if you want um, want a couple of pots to stand out somewhere, and do be careful, though, what, where you place them. I mean, I have to say this, because my garden is open to visitors, and we have to be careful where we put plants like this because they are vicious. They have vicious ends to them, ends to the leaves, very sharp spines. And they're, they're dangerous with pets and children and older people and, you know, all the rest of it. So you have got to be careful where you put them. Now, we've got completely um, sidetracked, I suppose, by various different plants in the pavilion. We haven't even been outside yet, uh, but oh. there was certainly... <laughs> There was certainly a lot to talk about. What did we say? This would be a 20-minute podcast, Alan. Um, <laughs> there was a lot 
a lot outside. Um, we were really lucky, actually. You don't get to go into many of the gardens, but Alan, you bumped into Tom Hoblin, who yeah. you know, he's um, based mm. in Suffolk, and he did the Boodles Secret Garden and That's actually right. had picked some really lovely different plants for that. Well, he had. I mean, I was taken by the fact that he was growing in the shady part of his garden, Impatien Sardenii. And it's a big old impatiens that uh, I grow. And I was, I was actually given it by Zara Tullimash of Helmingham Hall when I went there for a visit one day and she gave me a plant of that. Um, and I've grown it ever since. Um, it's not the most floriferous plants, but I mean, they're lovely, big, pale lavender, um, well, very pale mauve, I suppose. What, what colour would you say you saw it? Yeah, it was a sort of pink, yeah, pinky, pinky mauve. Pinky mauve. Um, and... I've got several forms of it, and, and not least a, a, a white one and a, a white one with a red heart in the middle of the, the flower as well. Um, but then no, I just, just saw that and we started talking with Tom about that. He'd been to the garden here at East Ruston some time ago, and so we spoke about that. And then he said, well, would you like to come in and I'll show you my garden? And he did, and he took us and he showed us uh, the plants. There was a lovely, I was much taken by this lovely little um, pink flowered, a butylon, oh, which I yes. thought was lovely because it, it it flowers quite profusely. Then it's not a bright pink, it's a pale pink, and it's it, it has a smart look about it. Do you know what I mean? It's like yeah. a, like a well-dressed lady. It just had that smart look about it. Um, and uh, <coughs> arching foliage and arching branches, which made for a very graceful plant, I think. And I think there was a little surprise because when you peered up into the flowers, they had a little kind of dark heart. So you kind it of looked did. into the, yes. Oh, yes, little extra. Yeah layer yes yeah so we didn't know the name of that one I think he he thought well, he might know the name but he was going to look it up and double check well he thought he'd been told it was pink flush or whatever it was it wasn't that but we just say that <coughs> and he said I don't think it is this um so there's some consternation over which variety it is doesn't matter it was a very pretty plant um and I think that I may have it here I bought um three lots of abutilons from Shrubland nurseries down in Suffolk I think there's one called Pink Charm, I believe. The other thing about Tom's garden, he had a plant that we didn't know and Val Bourne didn't know because we bumped into the wonderful Val Bourne, regular guest on this podcast, and had a proper good old hobnob about plants with her. But we took her to see this plant that Tom had shown us and she didn't recognise it either. And it was a Troutvaria carolineensis varjaponica. Variety japonica means, means it comes from Japan, really. So it's this Japanese woodlander, I think. <clears throat> He's got these sort of quite large jagged edged leaves and where the leaf joins the stem, it was dark chocolate maroon. And Tom said to us that it has flowers. I, I must look this up because I haven't done it yet, but it has flowers reminiscent of a very dwarf elytrum <clears throat> and a lovely little cloud of flowers like that that sells it for me anyway. Yeah, lovely leaves. And uh, yeah, very nice to see something nobody knew. Uh, the other plant he had, which uh, if you didn't know it going into the Chelsea Flower Show, you knew it afterwards because it was in 50% <laughs> of the gardens, I think. Uh, and rightly so, because it's a great plant, was Salvia oliginosa, which I've now had to learn to say because I've always stayed away from pronouncing it because I never know how to say it. But beautiful, big, blue, bright Salvia, which was everywhere. <laughs> it is everywhere. It was everywhere. You're absolutely right. And, and kind of rightly so. Because I think that you take some of the tall Rudbeckias, um, Heliopsis, Helianthus, all of those sort of perennial sunflower type plants, and you combine it with Salvia uliginosa, um, blue and you've got this blue and yellow. And if you can get the yellows more on the lemon side of yellow, that's a fantastic combination. And we saw that on several and, and several of the gardens, I think. Uh, interesting, because I, I, I don't know who she was, but I started, I started talking to this lady and she said, Oh, that damn thing can become a nuisance. And I thought, well, what a welcome nuisance. I think I said something like that. And she said, well, you wouldn't say so if you had the soil where it, the kind of soil where it runs around. And I said, well, it will never be a nuisance with me because my soil is relatively dry, which it is. Yeah. Um, and there used to be some um, doubt as, as to it surviving the winter 10, 15, 20 years ago, um, because it, it likes to really grow with wet feet. And it's when it has wet feet, it can become a nuisance. So if yeah. you've got a bit of a bog, buy some sal salvia uliginosa, and before <laughs> you know it, you'll have acres of it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's one of the reasons I haven't grown it, just in case it, it likes my clay too much. But it is lovely. And I was actually coveting it 
at yours in the garden, you know, the week before we went to Chelsea. So it yeah. was lovely to see it, you know, in lots of the lots of the show gardens. Yeah. Um, there were obviously lots of dailies around. I mean, talking of plants that are having their moment, there were particularly trade stands and, and the RHS gardens where they had kind of big banks of showy dahlias. You were a little disappointed to not see more species dahlias. Well, I think that, um, well, I think that probably the reason we didn't see that many dahlias was because the, the way that the fashion is for naturalistic planting. And I think that most dahlias look anything but natural. I mean, they do, they pop up and they look, they've got big leaves. They're not, they're not the prettiest of plants, really. They're difficult to, to <coughs> use in, in a garden setting, some of the bigger ones. Um, they have coarse foliage as well. I did notice that there's a, there was a, a very dark star-shaped dahlia called Verone subsidian, which we saw incorporated in several gardens because that is relatively short growing and quite discreet. <coughs> and it has the very dark star-shaped flowers, which are very striking. Um, but no, I think that you could have made, I mean, there's um, Dahlia murkii, for instance. I've got a very dark form of that, which I grew from seed by selecting the parents. So I, I selected two with very dark stems, hoping that they would have dark flowers, which they did. I grew them apart from all the rest, saved the seed, and I've now got one with very, very dark flowers, which I think is rather interesting. Um, it's just nice to do things like that to get, but I think the one thing about um, Dahlia murkii, I've got big strand stands of it in the garden and it does make a big statement. It's got small star-like mauve flowers. Um, the petals kick up at the ends rather delightfully actually. Um, and it has fern-like foliage, which is always nice, not that big glabrous foliage of some of the big ones. And it might be why it ended up being incorporated into one garden. Now, the downside of not being able to go into the gardens, because obviously we all stand around the edge with everybody else peering in and you, you do miss plants. And I didn't actually see, I'm fairly certain from the plant list, um, that Dahlia murky I was in the Yeo Valley Garden, the Yeo Valley Organic Garden by Tom Massey, with some help from the Yeo Valley head gardener, Sarah Mead, um, which was lovely naturalistic planting, lots of sort of plants coming up through grasses. So I'm assuming that's why they'd gone for Dahlia Murkii in there, but yeah. I sadly didn't clap eyes on it. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, that's one of the things I think that um, it would be nice if somebody, some of the plant breeders, I don't know whether it's possible, but I think it would be nice if we could actually have, um, shall we say, slightly less tall dahlias um, with fern-like foliage, if they could breed for the fern-like foliage and the small flowers, and they could, you know, they, the colour range could be increased um, rather than just the mauves uh, yeah. or the whites that we've got at the moment. It would be lovely to do that, I think, and that would be infinitely more usable in the gardens that are fashionable today. Yeah, and a naturalistic was again, regardless of a different time of year, very much the trend for some of the gardens uh, on Main Avenue. The Year Valley Organic Garden was one of them. And um, rising above their sort of naturalistic planting was this fabulous Rudbeckia laciniata herbstone, which yeah. I, that is, that's gone onto my Flomo list. I mean, fabulous, big, tall and lovely and yellow, sort of shining joyfully above the planting. Yeah, lots of people that I, I think today, they probably don't, um... You use enough of these very tall radbeckias, but I can see why, because I think it was two years ago from <coughs> um, the Plantsman's Preference Nursery, I bought a, a very tall cream flowered um, radbeckia um, and cre creamy lemon flowered. I, the name evades me at the moment, but doesn't matter. Um, and I, <laughs> I walked into the border where it was the other day and I looked up like that. <laughs> and it's eight feet tall. I mean, that's probably why. Yeah. Um, but it is at the back of the border. It's completely self-supporting. Um, the border doesn't have an awful lot of irrigation on it. It just has some pipes on the ground, seepage pipes. Um, that's all it has. Because if I watered it from above, it probably would get bashed down. The dahlia next to it is a, a one that came from Creek Farm, another podcaster we have in common. Uh, and... <laughs> that is nine or ten feet tall. That's a tree dahlia, and that has been in play in this garden since the end of July. So I was oh. pleased that because most of the tree dahlias that we grow in our gardens, we don't get the flowers because our summers are not long enough. But this one you do, and I was pleased to have that. Lovely. I mean, it is great to be able to really sort of enjoy the season and enjoy kind of seeing the things like from your garden 
at the Chelsea Flower Show, be they great big tall Rebeccas and Helianthus um, or Dahlias. The real standout, I think, for celebrating seasonality was the M&G Garden. I mean, going into the Chelsea Flower Show, everybody was raving about the M&G Garden. And I sort of went in a bit thinking, oh, it, it can't be that good, surely. And it really was. <laughs> I mean, we kept going back to look at it. I was just going to say that. Every time we saw something different, something yeah. new. It took, it took three visits from us to actually grasp that garden, I think. Now, the, the reason I think is because it was so cleverly planted by Charlotte and Hugo, and um, it, had, it had a theme running through it. Um, and you, to, if, you, if you cast your eye over it and then walked on, you would think, that, well, it just consists of five plants. And they're all, and, but it didn't. I mean, there were many, many different plants in there. And there was little vignettes within each area that you looked at. Um, which was absolutely superb. I enjoyed that enormously. And as you said, you kept going back to it. And you had to keep going back to it because each time you did, you saw something new. I picked on a couple of things. One is my Floma, which we'll come to later on. Um, but another thing that I suddenly realised is that I don't use Rosa rubrifolia enough. Um, and we, we got seedlings of it all over the garden. And I just so suddenly thought you're not using it well enough because there they had it in the garden, they had it with hips on it. It looks absolutely gorgeous. And that lovely glaucous cast to the foliage was absolutely fantastic. And I thought, well, what you need to do with it, I looked at theirs very carefully, what you need to do with it, you need to prune it. So I've got to manipulate this rose to do what I want it to do, not just leave it to get on with it. Yeah, I think the garden itself, um, they had these big pipes running through it which I basically stopped seeing. It, I, I, quite so often, I. I quite often get a bit sort of, um, because I'm there mostly for the plants, a lot of the hard landscaping I could take or leave. But the amazing thing about this garden was when I first walked up, I thought, oh, all these pipes sort of getting in the way. But the planting was so strong and so mesmerising that you just stopped seeing the pipes at all um, and focused in on the plants. And also you had these extraordinary trees rising above um, and I'm not very good on trees so I did write them down they'd um, chosen them for their tolerance to urban climate extremes so they had the Nissa sylvatica the black gum tree uh, the naturalistic uh, silvery leaves of Hippophaea rhamnoides the sea buckthorn well, that's, and that's, yeah that grows along our coast on the dunes here so um, very so tolerant to very tolerant yeah. and Eliagnus umbellata the autumn olive so but the, I mean, the size, you can't even imagine the logistics of getting those trees in, which I know is what Chelsea is all about. But they did bring so much um, sort of such an established look, therefore, having these fabulous trees sort of towering above and then woven beneath it, just lots of different, you know, more shady and more open planting. And you spotted um, because you're clever and observant, various themes like coloured stems running through and different colours being picked up very subtly that really brought all those plants together. That, it, it reinforces the thing that Christo Lloyd once said to me. Um, he said, when you, when you look at a plant, look, look and see. He said, I'll illustrate the point. He said, I'll give you this flower to look at. And I can't remember what it was now. But he said, look at that. <laughs> and they said, give it back to me. So he said, how many stamens has it got? I didn't know. And he said, that's what I want you to look at. I want you to look at it and I want you to see it and go through it methodically and take your time and look. And when you do, I mean, it helps with the, your, the way you visualize things. Your powers of observation are increased and everything else. I mean, it just, it just works. And somebody, those two people, Charlotte and Hugo there, they have an eye that works together that is... Um, it takes this theme. I mean, they see things probably other people don't. They'll see that this red stem matches that red stem. Yeah. Um, and, you know. Well, things like the, the dark stem of Selenum willichianum. I mean, you see those umbels. You don't necessarily yeah. see its stem, but then you kind mm. of will look through the planting <laughs> and you'd see that there, there was that and then the dark stems of the aster that was there as well. Um, and seed heads, I mean, using Tulipa Sprengeri seed heads in the garden, they were fantastic. Yeah, yeah and, and also we saw in another garden, I don't know whether you remember, the, um, the dying heads of Acanthus mollis. Um, but they, they just have that, that shape, that form, that, that um, is in the garden. 
And you know, when we, any of us who grow tulipus brengeri, you probably want to get those dead stems out of the way, but it just shows you don't need to. If, it depends how you see them. If you see them as untidiness, well then take them away if they offend you. But if you, if you can broaden your horizon to think of them as that as being part of the natural landscape, if you like, it's, it's the life of the plant, isn't it? Yeah, it's they had life. lots. Lots of lovely grasses as well, you know, talking of seed heads, you know, lots of grasses really having their moment all intermingled and and helping plants like Echinacea pallida to really shine because they were sort of daintily there amidst all of the lovely different grass heads. Um, we saw we saw uh, Echinacea pallida with those lovely hanging drooping petals. Um, and then we saw a yellow form towards the front, didn't you remember? Which I think, I went and looked up, I think was Paradoxa. Ah. And it was lovely, they had the same sort of form, but obviously completely different character because of their colour, and they were used at sort of opposite sides of the garden. Yeah, I mean, that was, it was just something that you noticed because that shape echoes that shape, but they're different colours. I mean, there was, there, there was that kind of thing going through, through the garden. And another thing that I loved, over a piece of stone, there was this clematis that had been planted and it was tumbling at the back of the stone behind it and it was tumbling forward. And together with that, there was a, a, a rubus, a blackberry relative with black fruit on it. And the leaves were just going a little bit um, autumnal in color, uh, a bit yellow. And just next to it was a seedling from this very same plant. And I thought that is just how you would see it growing naturally. There would be a seedling there from, from some of the fruit that had been left or, or, you know, popped out by a bird or something like that. Um, you know, it, it was just so incredibly well observed and well thought. It was incredibly well thought out and well planted. Um, mm. the, there, was, there were just so many plants. You noticed there was a euphorbia. I think it was Willichii that was sort of dotted through. So you got that thread. There were <laughs> these you got little, little pots of lime green, didn't you? And yeah, suddenly that zing. And there was the, the Hakanakloa as well, Hakanakloa yes. macro, these hummocks of... Well, of, they're like big fluffy cushions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to go I've, and sort of have got, a little snooze. <laughs> yeah, I've got some in pots, in actual fact, and I think to myself, I, I just thought to myself, that is the way to use them. And throughout this, this kind of planting, it's lovely. I did want to come home and make an autumn border just like that, really. Um, yeah. But, you know... You know, you can't replicate it entirely like that. The other thing that I took away from this garden was perhaps um, the thought that if you garden and there is some some kind of eyesore, a, i.e. those pipes, um, you know, they couldn't take them away. So they made a garden feature out of them. Um, I'm not sure, sure that you'd like to make the feature out of something like that. But, you know, the, there is a time when if, you, if your planting is exciting enough, you don't see the eyesore. So don't give up if you've got an eyesore. <laughs> yeah. I saw he saw she saw. <laughs> or she saw. I mean, we probably could have done an entire podcast just about that garden. And there are other things that we haven't really had a time to talk about, like their acteas, which were just so fat, fun and of the season, um, which were sort of at the back doing their thing, yep. being full of personality. Um, and and I think probably we should do Flomo because we've been talking for ages. Um, <laughs> because both of our Flomos, I think, came from the M&G garden. Yours, if people look at the plant list, isn't even on the plant list. So it's oh. well worth being listening to this podcast so that you can identify this plant because everybody is surely going to want to grow it. Well, it's an old favourite, really, isn't it? It's Solidago, goldenrod. But this is the little dwarf one called Lemore. And it is... That like little dwarf dumplings of it, and if you plant it with something like um aster monch, I'm not sure that's called an aster anymore, it probably isn't. Um, but as we knew it, um, with the lovely purple flowers, it looked tremendous. It you know, some of these old plants they became unfashionable. Goldenrod became un unfashionable, it got a bad name. There are two varieties of goldenrod that I like, one is called Lemoor, which I saw at the Chelsea Flower Show, an old variety from childhood. And another one is fireworks, which we saw um, the other day at, at the plant fair at East Russell, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, and, and Tom Brown picked that one out, another favourite of his in our podcast. Yeah, yeah. so another, another fun, different Solidago. Yes, yeah, exactly. So that's my fire flamo. Now, I hardly dare ask you this, nowadays, but... <laughs> How many would you like? <laughs> well, 
Uh, so FOMO obviously being plants that give you FOMO that you want to grow. I mean, as you remember, I spent a lot of time talking about daisy root stands. So Rudbeckia triloba and Subtermentosa. I mean, there are so many different ones from Blackjack to Henry Eilis. Uh, I've already got Prairie Glow. That's one I don't have to get. Um, but I'm going to stick with the M&G garden and unusually for me, because I am drawn to showy, exciting flowers more than probably anything else. But wherever you looked in the M&G garden, the Amsonia just <laughs> stole the show. How a seed head, how a plant that's gone to seed could be so stunning. I just that that's my big takeaway. And kind of every time I think back to that garden, it's just the the pop of colour. And I think it was Amsonia ta Tabernay Montana, if I said yeah. that right. Yeah. And it just combines so well with everything that was planted with. I've, I've wanted Amsonias in the past, but things have to serve up a lot of interest, different seasons of interest in the small garden. So I'm fairly certain now the Amsonia has won its place. Well, the Amsonia won its place for me because as Nancy Lancaster, a great gardener and interior decorator once said, I do like a little touch of butter yellow. <laughs> and those leaves were butter yellow. <laughs> oh, it was glorious. And if you're lucky enough to go, I hope you love the M&G garden as much as we did. If you don't, you'll probably love another garden just as much. Nigel Slater, I saw he'd posted about going to Chelsea. We didn't get the chance to talk to him. We saw him scuttling off, a man who really loves his plants. And I, I think it was the 60 degree um, garden that he really loved. And it, I mean, that's the first one we saw. And there was a lot to love in that real celebration of philictrums and water and pines and things. So there's basically something for everybody, I think, at this year's Chelsea. Oh, it's a different Chelsea entirely. But I mean, as you can tell, anyone that's had the, had the tenacity to stay and listen to our podcast, <laughs> you can tell there's a lot to see and a lot of interest. Um, and we haven't scratched the surface, not really. We talked about the, some of the more obvious things, but there were lots of other lovely little, little, um, little pops of, of gardens. And, oh, I don't know, there's just so much to see. It was so many ideas. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah, there's obviously loads of coverage on the BBC um, and that'll be on iPlayer and, and probably accessible all over the place if you happen to be uh, tuning in elsewhere in the world. But hopefully we've managed to really shine a spotlight on some of the plants, because in the more general coverage, you don't necessarily get to know the names of the plants. And we just wanted to make sure that you got a plant list uh, from this year's Chelsea of our favourites, if nothing else. And it took us... Um, about four times as long as we meant. So I'm sorry, Alan. You can get back <laughs> to the now. Shall we have a quick 20-minute chat, she said. Well, you can see what we're like. <laughs> you can finally get back to the, the 32 acres at East Ruston Old Vicarage. Thank that you for listening. Me. <laughs> Thank you for staying with us for all this time and enjoy Chelsea. Happy gardening. Happy gardening. See you soon. <laughs> As soon as we connect, I don't know what's happening outside. Peter's gone out to take a call. Builder has turned up. Lily's barking. <laughs> <laughs> and over in Cambridgeshire, we have a floral fantasia this morning. A thoughtless. <laughs> thoughtless. Oh, sorry, I messed that up. I like floral fantasia though. That was All bloody right. marvellous. <laughs> um, and this is one that I've wanted for a long time. This is. Um, uh, this is. Got the name of it now. A uh, cross between Sempervivums and and uh, Aeonium. Aeonium. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Hey.